by your presence in the worship, Lord, in the body of Christ assembled in this place, Father. Um, Lord, we thank you for being our God. We thank you for being a God who moves in our lives on a daily basis, Lord, that, that we can take comfort and rest in the fact that you are there through it all. Good, bad, rain, sun, snow, hail, calm seas, rough seas. You are our God. So we trust you, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, and we worship you, God. And we say, thy will be done in this place, in this time. You are holy, you are mighty, you are loving, and we love you. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to anoint this voice, anoint this mind, to preach your word today, Lord God. And I pray for hearts to be opened up to receive this word, Lord, to receive something in this word that they've never really maybe seen before and have a deeper understanding of who you are. In the name of Jesus, amen. So I'm going to be reading a, a large chunk of scriptures, and um, it's going to be verse 1 through 26 we're going to read, and it's the complete story of the woman at the well in Samaria. Now, just to give you a little background, this is John chapter 4, okay? Uh, of all the Gospels, John's is the one that di diverges the most from the other writers of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all right? Um, in this Gospel there are um, many stories left out that are in the other three Gospels. But in this Gospel, there's a message portrayed that is left out of the other Gospels. John is unique. John was the believer who was closest to the Lord, and his insight into the heart of the Lord is evident in this Gospel. Okay? Now, um, if you don't know John 1 through 4, then you won't know this, but I'm, that's why I'm telling it to you now. In chapter 3... John has his first encounter, uh, Jesus has his first encounter with a person, first story of an interaction, and it's with a man named Nicodemus, and Nicodemus is a Pharisee, he's a leader of the community, he's a man of prestige among the Jewish uh, elite of the time, and therefore, he has a fear of man. Uh, that's my phone ringing. No, it's not. It's my ringtone. It's Nancy's phone. Sorry, Pastor. That's his phone. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. So, uh, where was I? Oh, yes, Nicodemus. So, Nicodemus had a lot to lose. Amen? It's not amen, but... In this man's uh, heart, he had a fear. He had a fear of, of what will they think if they see me going to see Jesus. So what he does is he goes at night to meet him. He goes under the cover of darkness so that nobody will see him. And he goes and has this interaction with Jesus. And this is the story where somebody, you might have heard this before, he goes, what am I supposed to do, crawl back into my mother's womb? Because Jesus says, you must be born again. And he explains to Nicodemus that, no, that's not exactly what I mean. And he, go, he speaks in spiritual language. But the point here is that this rich, prestigious, influential, religious man had to go see the Savior in the cover of darkness and then misunderstood what he was saying. Took what he was saying literally. Then we arrive in chapter 4, and he runs into this woman who does the exact same thing. But rather than being a leader, this woman is poor. Rather than being prestigious, this woman is of ill repute. Rather than being a leader, she's a nobody. Rather than being a good Jew, she's an outcast of the Jews, a Samaritan. And when he speaks to her, we're going to see, she receives the word in the exact same way, literally. She misses the point. She tries to avoid. She tries to deflect. And Jesus pushes through. But the message here is that Jesus came for everybody. 
He came for the rich Jew who's religious, and he came for the adulterous woman who's been married five times. See, she came to see, she came to the well, and Jesus went to meet her in the heat of the day. She, he, she came to the well, and Jesus went to meet her in a time of the day where nobody else would go to the well. It's hot. You want to get to the well, get your business done to make the trek before the heat of the day, right? Now, when Nicodemus met Jesus, he went and sought Jesus out at night. But when this woman met Jesus, it wasn't because she planned on it. Jesus planned on it. Okay? And uh, so what we're going to see here is the unfolding of the story and how God works in just such mighty and wonderful ways. John chapter 4. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was, who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right in saying you have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Hallelujah. The title of this word today is When the Believer Ministers to God, which is the essence of the message that he's saying about true worship worshiping in spirit and truth. Um, if you recall, on the cross, at one point, Jesus looked down and said, I thirst. Well, here in this scenario, he sits at a well and he says to a woman, I thirst. Can I have a drink? It's not just about being thirsty. It's about the Lord. He came to seek and save a people. He came to seek and save a race. And the... Uh, Giving of a drink to the Lord is to respond to the gospel call. To say, Lord, I hear you. I, I repent. I, I come to you, Lord. Whether I be rich or poor, whether I be a prestigious leader 
or an adulterous woman, Lord, I come to you. I repent. I turn to you, Lord. Save me. And then seek to follow him. Again, it's not a call to uh, never, never make a mistake. It's not a call that says, you know, you only have one chance. His mercy is new every morning. But there is a, a distinct call to change, to turn, and to, and to start walking in a new direction. The gospel call does not stop simply at your response to the cross. It's, it's a call to a life of holiness in Jesus Christ, not for holiness' sake, but for love's sake. When the believer ministers to God. First point is that Jesus, his meeting with this woman, was not an accident. It was intentional. You see, it says in... Um, in verse 4, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. Well, guess what? He didn't have to pass through Samaria. The last thing that Jews would want to do when going from Judea to Galilee was pass through Samaria. Samaria was an outcast Israel, so to speak. A little background. Israel was conquered by, um, well, Judea. Uh, the northern kingdom of Israel was conquered by the Assyrians. And when they lost, the Assyrians came and they took all the Jews out of the northern kingdom. They brought them to Assyria. Now, that's impossible to do. You cannot completely do that. So there were people left. Maybe they were hiding in caves. Maybe they were hiding in closets. Whatever. They, did, they took who they could. They took, and then they transplanted Assyrians into Samaria, into Israel, the northern kingdom. Okay. What then happened were these Jews came out and they began to intermingle with the, Samar with the um, Assyrians. And they uh, intermarried, which was forbidden by Jews. And then they started adopting other gods into their Jewish worship, which was forbidden in Israel. Right? And then what eventually happened was the southern kingdom, uh, Israel, no, Jerusalem and the, yeah, the southern kingdom, they were conquered by Babylon. And they were brought into exile for 70 years. And then they came back. They maintained their separateness. They came back to Israel, and they were going to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. The Samaritans came to them and said, we want to help. We worship the same God as you. And the Jews said, absolutely not. You do not worship the same God as us. You've perverted this religion. And we want nothing to do with you. You are outcast. You are no longer considered part of Israel. So what they did was they built their own temple in Samaria. And they stayed away from each other. So on the way to, uh, to get from Judea to Galilee, there were two routes. There was a long route that the Jews made so that they could avoid Samaria. And then there was a short route that went right through Samaria. That's the route Jesus took. That's the route that day that he said, I must go to Samaria. He had a date in Samaria. He had an appointment in Samaria. He had just spoken to a man of the southern kingdom, Nicodemus, in chapter 3. Now he had to go to those who are outcasts, those who are considered unclean. A woman who had five husbands and was now living with somebody out of wedlock. And he had an appointment to go see her at a well to give her the same good news that he gave to this man. Amen? It's good news. The message to both, the gospel is open to all, that all might be saved. Now, I title this, When the Believer Ministers to God. And the word minister in the Hebrew is the word sharath, to attend to to contribute to. And I thought that was very interesting when I looked that up. To attend to is pretty obvious, right? I'm going to attend to God, like a waiter attends to a table at a restaurant. That's really part of the word. We are there to serve God. But then it says to contribute to. 
And that is really what Jesus is saying here when he says, give me a drink. Contribute to the work that, that I've come to do. I've come to seek and save you. Respond. I didn't come here so that you could refuse me and go to hell. Now look, that is there. It always will be there because it was always our fate prior to Jesus since the fall. But he came that all men and women might be saved, whether you're a Jew or whether you're a Samaritan whether you're an Italian or you're a Polish, whether you're Muslim or Buddhist, he came to seek each and every one of us. In the Greek, the, the word is diakoneo for minister, to assist, to serve under. But to assist, Lord, can I assist you? Yes, I, I would like a drink, respond to my word, and then go, see, go and seek and save the lost, just like I did. I am now using you as my body here on earth. Your life no longer is your own. I have bought you with a price. Now, here is what I say. I'm not saying you can't pursue um, things that all men and women wish to pursue in life. What I am saying is that I need to be the overwhelming purpose, the gospel, the light that saves, the light in the darkness, because one day, the time of being able to do this will end, and we're quickly coming upon that time. To assist or to serve under. To be an attendant who waits upon another or others. So Jesus says to the woman, give me a drink, or can I please have a drink? Our ministry to God is our response to him. Worship ministers to God because we were created to do so. Worship ministers to God because we were created to do so. It is one of our purposes. You know, as a Christian, you have two purposes. The first is to glorify God in your life. Now, I'm not going to get into all the ways you can glorify God in your life, but you know it's not hard to figure out. There are definite ways you can either glorify God or despise God. The second is to enjoy God. You see, he didn't leave it so that yours was just a burden that he put on you, a yoke. Everyone know what a yoke is? You have to think of oxen plowing a field. That big round thing they put around their neck, that's called a yoke. In other words, it subjugates them to the plowman and the plow to push a blade through dirt, rocky dirt. It's, it's labor. It's hard labor. But what did Jesus say? A, there's a yoke, you're going to wear one as a Christian. But guess what? His yoke isn't burdensome. And I reflect on those verses when he says that, and, and I think to myself, you know, there's been plenty of times where the yoke has been difficult. When you have family reject you because of that, it's difficult. When you have friends or loved ones you, you feel the separation there now because you're different. You've changed. It's not easy. Yet in that time, in those times, the yoke still is not that difficult. And why? Love. I am no longer bound by a yoke with a plow in the dirt with a man behind me with a whip compelling me to move forward. There's no whip. The blade doesn't rest in the dirt as much as on the dirt. I, I'm, I'm doing what I do because I love and, and of what he has done for me. The yoke is easy and his burden is light. And then when I f make my mistakes and when I fall, he doesn't come in with the Bible to whack me over the head and, and send me to hell. He comes like a loving father saying, Child, come on, let's keep going. Just get up, brush it off, brush off the carnality, brush off the smoking, brush off the cursing, brush off the, name the sin that, that you commit. Brush it off. In other words, repent, turn back to me, keep going. Keep going. This is a lifelong walk. If we wish to, 
or indeed would minister to God. We would do and attain those two things. Glorify God and enjoy God. And, you know, what happens is for a lot of people, when you come to church, if you're not really, if something's off in your walk, when you hear the word, unless the preacher, of course, is preaching in an oppressive way, um, you should leave with an enjoyment of God, whether it was through the worship, the fellowship, the word, all those things. If you're leaving feeling oppressed, something's wrong, either with the minister or with you. As we seek to follow the Lord, if everything is right, your walk with the Lord, your response to the Lord, your uh, desire for the Lord, you should be getting a, uh, a response called enjoyment. You should be enjoying this. This wasn't meant to be torture, an inconvenience, something you fit into your busy, busy life. You see, and if our hearts are right, the more we hear and the more we do and the more we're involved, the more our enjoyment should be increasing in Christ. I have found in my experience that I have never come to a place where I saw a graduating um, decrease in my desire to hang out with you. It hasn't happened. I look forward to Sundays. She looks forward to Sundays. Looks forward to something. You know what I mean? I enjoy the body of Christ. You are his body. You are his body. Jesus thirsted at the well. What is the thirst of Christ but to have those he came to save drink from him? That his desire at the well and that and that was his desire on the cross when he again stated that he thirsted for his creation to be reconciled back to him and to the Father. John 13 and 14, uh, 4, 13 and 14 say, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. That water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water. And the New Living Translation said it really cool. And it says, a fresh, bubbling spring within them, welling up to eternal life. The material is not nearly as important as the spiritual. The material equals temporary life, right? Body, heartbeat, age, die. All right? The uh, spiritual equals the eternal life. Now, you have your spirit in you now. You have a part of eternity in you right now. But where the body drops away, the spirit will live on. And, and I like uh, Newton's words in Amazing Grace. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we'll, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Can you even conceive being around 10,000 years from now? And even then, you'll be able to look down eternity and not be able to see the end. And you'll look back at this 70, 80, 90 years, and you'll be like, it was nothing, nothing in God's economy. The water that I will give him will become a spring of water, a fresh bubbling spring within them. Now, Elsewhere in the Bible, it says that we, um, the wrong way to be, I think it's in Proverbs, is as a broken cistern. You see, as a, as a believer, well, as an unbeliever, let's start there. What unbelievers do is they have a well. And they fill up that well with whatever they will fill up that well with. And they draw from that well for their life experiences on what decisions to make, how to do things, right? And the Bible says that if that's what you do, your cistern's broken, man. It's got a crack in it. Everything that's in there is going to leak out. It's going to have no value whatsoever. In Christ, he takes that well. He demos it. He drills down until a spring bursts forth. Now, what's the word spring mean? Boing. Right? And that's what the water does. 
Whoosh. Bursts forth. And it keeps bursting forth. Right? So you have the spring of water within you. And because it's in you, it's pressed down, shaken, to overflowing. Right? It's meant to overflow. I'm meant to overflow into your life, into your life, into your life, into your life. That's what I'm meant to do. That's what you're, you're meant to overflow into my life, into her life, and into your mother's life, into your uncle's life, into your nephew's life, into your co-worker's life. That's what we're meant to do. Actually, a spring can't help but do that. It goes everywhere. You can't control it. And really, when I say those words, I think that really aptly describes how I feel when I'm around non-believers. I, I feel like, Lord, if I, you know, he put a call in my mouth, and if I don't speak, it's going to burn me up, man. But you know what else happens with a spring? You know what else a spring creates? This was one of my first major blowouts studying this. It creates mud. You see, what we do with our life is we take, uh, we all do this as Christians, because we're babies. When we come to Christ, we have no idea what we're doing. We still try to pursue our own goals, our own motivations. We still are that same, you know, you have the high of being a Christian, coming to Christ, and then three weeks later, somebody yells at you and you yell back. You curse at them. Maybe you bill that extra 15 minutes when you clock out, you know, or, or you take the post-it notes from the stock supply closet or, you know, whatever, man. I'm just making up things. What you're doing is you're taking a plow, a bulldozer, the spring's bursting up, and you're taking that bulldozer and you're trying to cover it. Intentionally or unintentionally, consciously or subconsciously, you're putting dirt over the spring. Now, the spring ain't going to be stopped. And it's shooting forth. And what's being created is mud. And a lot of times, this muddiness is what's evident in the life of especially a younger believer. It's obvious, it's evident that they're playing with the world and they're playing with the cross. Um, they're, they're constantly having these struggles and they can't understand why their life is like this, yet they never really stop to take a look at the fact that they keep putting the world above God. That their eyes have, have been fixed on the material and the temporal rather than on the spiritual and the eternal. And we do it in so many different ways, folks. I, I got the t-shirt. I should have wore a dirt t-shirt today, right? And what happens all too often is the focus goes on to the mud. We've got to stay focused on the spring. Because no matter how muddy your life is and how muddy it gets, you have a spring of life bubbling forth, overflowing, outflowing. And that is where the Lord is bringing you. He is the finisher of your faith. He is the author. Think of finishing school. He's the author. He starts the book. It's a blank book, and he starts it, and he puts... He puts Cheryl's name in this book, and he's like, okay, here we go. Non-believer, 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 non-believer. Right here is where I'm going to get her, right here. And after this, believer, believer. It's pretty muddy in here. Oh, wait. Okay, good. It gets better. Okay. It's getting better. It's getting, you know what I mean? He's the author, and he's the finisher. When this book closes, it'll close because he finished that book in your, called Your Life, right? And finishing school, he, he will... He will turn you into that person with the proper Christian etiquette, the proper Christian blah, blah, blah. The cro you know, he will make you into his image. That is the proper Christian. That is the perfect Christian. That is the ultimate, the fulfillment of your faith is you will be identical to Christ as Jacinta, as Betty, as Nancy. It'll be... It'll be um, Maureen dash Christ. Now, you won't be God. All right? He's got one only begotten son. But you will be his splitting image. Nancy dash Christ. Josh dash Christ. Tom dash Christ. Praise God, man. I, I just get overwhelmed. John chapter 6, verses 53 through 58 say this. I tell you the truth. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise that person at the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. For anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me. 
and I in him. I live because of the living Father who sent me. In the same way, anyone who feeds on me will live because of me. I am the true bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will not die as your ancestors did, even though they ate the manna, but will live forever. It doesn't say there'll never be mud. He just says, if you continue to eat from me, you will live forever. If you continue to drink that living water, you will live forever. You know what the Bible says in, I think it's in Revelation, where you know, we, we start in Genesis and there's the tree of life, right? And then there's the tree of knowledge of good and evil, bad tree, apple. That's why this apple's here to show whenever we're doing our will, we continue to bite the same apple Adam and Eve did. But there's the tree of life. And it says in Revelation two things. One, whereas in Genesis is one tree of life, in the main way of heaven, of Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, will be lined with trees of life. And we will partake of those trees forever and ever. But folks, that tree of life is sitting right here right now. Sitting right here right now. Sitting right here right now. All we have to do is keep taking of it and we will live forever. Now, look at that conversely. Don't take from it. Is that possibility there? Life is full of possibilities. Live forever, die forever. Right? But he's not talking about it. He's saying about take, drink, eat, and you will live forever. See, that's his will. He doesn't want to see anyone go to hell. He doesn't want to see anyone suffer an eternity of torment. He didn't die on a cross Get tortured and suffer so that you can go to hell. His love for you is so deep that he bore the unbearable for you and for me. My third point, John 4.22, your worship, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. It speaks of origin. It speaks of source. What is the source of the gospel in the world? Well, it's Jesus, obviously, right? But Jesus came through the Jews. You see, and what happened was it, it didn't make... Judaism right, he's simply saying that in the plan of salvation, in God's economy, he birthed me through Israel. From the beginning of time, he knew that he would create Israel, he would create the religion called Judaism, and through that faith, I would be born. All of the truths of eternity are within this book, which is the Old Testament is the Jewish Torah. Okay. He's not saying that for, from the beginning and forevermore, if you are not Jewish, you do not have the true faith. That's not what he's saying. He's saying actually quite the contrary. You see, as I said at the beginning, when uh, Israel returned and they tried to build a temple and the Samaritans offered to help, they, they rejected them. And they said, you guys, we want nothing to do with you, you low-life West Uticans. Be gone. So they went and they created their own religion. It was a, a perverted Judaism. It was a Judaism with, with worldly faiths intermingled. And the message here isn't that Judaism alone saves. It's that false man-created religion will never save, even if it looks like Christianity. That's the message. We have to teach the truth. Once we start creating our own doctrines for this, um, let me modernize this for you. Once we make this into a motivational gospel, a, 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 a self-healing discourse, you know, once we start doing in any way that we create doctrine so that the focus comes off of God and onto me, I have created a perverted Christianity. I have created a gospel that will not save. Now look, 
If you walk with the Lord, I promise you, you'll get more confidence. If you walk with the Lord, I promise you, you will get stamina. Now, look, you're going to get stamina from trials. I didn't say you wouldn't get trials. What I'm saying is he will use all these things to increase the good in you, the uh, biblically defined good in you, all right? Your stamina, your fortitude, your faith, your compassion, your, your love, your mercy, your intelligence, your wisdom. He will increase all these things. He will not remove you from the world. He will use the world to make you into a stronger believer if you will let him. And another point is that to worship God in spirit and in truth is not just about corporate worship. To worship God in spirit and truth is not simply about coming to church on Sunday and, and singing along with the beautiful worship that we had and sitting here um, patiently and, and uh, with your attention focused on. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate that. But you know, your worship, this is only two hours, three hours a week. Does your worship incorporate into your individual life outside of here? Does it, does it get incorporated as a family? Is there some sort of worship happening there as a family unit? As the body, you're here. Thank you. Worshiping. But at all other times, what is our attitude towards Jesus? Are we drinking from the well? Are we, in drinking from the well, which is Jesus Christ, are we then honoring him by living for him and, drink, and giving him a drink? Right? I mean, think of it this way. It's like, you know, what father, what mother who pours into their child's life um, would despise if the ch watching the child do something that was totally what you taught them? Think about the feeling. I, I, for many of you, I, you don't have to think about it. You know the feeling when you see your child react in obedience and understanding willfully to what you've taught them or spoken into their life. How great a feeling that must be. Multiply that by spades for the Lord when he sees us doing that. Contrarily, when we see disobedience, how that must affect the heart of God. Well, you know, I love about, the thing I love about Jesus is that he expressed both of these. You know, there's a time in the Bible he goes, man, how long do I have to put up with you guys? He said that. What, you know what he said? He goes, how long must I suffer you? Look, we all get frustrated from time to time. He was part human. Is. Always will be. You know, Jesus is still a man today. He's just in a different place. In Deuteronomy 6, Moses sets down for the Israelites how they are to love their God. Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 6. Listen, this is called the Shema. This is a, the holy Jewish prayer. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, all your soul, and all, oh, this isn't the Shema, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly. You must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to loving him, to walking with him, to learning from him, to living for him. But you see, it's got to be wholeheartedly. It can't be whole-mindedly. See, whole-mindedly is, you got to do this. This is what he wants. You got to do this. As opposed to saying, oh, yeah, I've been doing that, Lord. I'm, I repent, Lord. I'm so sorry. I love you. I'm going to set myself, Lord, to doing this now. Thank you for revealing that to me. It's a big difference in heart there, isn't there? Because the idea of strength in Hebrew indicates totality, Jesus expanded this expression to mind and strength. Right? Um, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. That's Mark 12, 30, and Luke 10, 27. In other words, 
And you must love the Lord with your being, your entire being. For many years, as a person who studied the Bible and um, tried to walk as a Christian, um, yet maintain my individual desires in the world, even if they weren't totally Christian or totally given over to God, um, I often wondered to myself, what would it be like if I actually did do that? Oh, the horror, right? And, and any of you who have heard my testimony know that when I walked away from the Lord, after I walked with him for three years, when I first said the sinner's prayer, my prayer to him was, Lord, I know I didn't experience all of you because I didn't give you all of me. And if I ever come back, it will only be if I'm ready to give you everything. I don't regret that at all. I don't regret saying those words, and I don't regret the day I came back to him and I went out on my deck and I said, Lord, I'm back, and you have all of me. And what I thought would be this fearful, uh, unknown quality of life or quantity of life as a Christian, might it be a life of deprivation, might it be a life of, not, of, of disappointment, might it be a life of, of feeling like I never achieved what I set out to achieve, feeling this, feeling that. None of that was true. That was all the fog of Satan's lies, the fog of the world saying, oh man, if you do that, you are in trouble. Goodbye happiness. No, hello happiness. Hello, joy. Hello, peace. Hello, love. True love for the first time. If you want to feel the depths of love, give him everything. And you will feel the depths of love of Jesus Christ, of what he has for you, and, and, and what you have for other people. You see, that's what happens. You start loving others as Jesus loved you. And you look like a fool sometimes. People will be like, why are you even taking the time to speak to this guy in the street? Come on, man. We're going to the bar. No, hold on a minute. Right? I heard a story with somebody here who was on vacation, and, and, and that's exactly what happened. They turned the car around, and they went and they ministered to somebody. You know, And, and the family thought he was nuts until the situation unfolded itself. And it became a, a Christ experience. Life is full of adventures like this for you, where you'll find a deeper sense of fulfillment than any uh, worldly uh, job success can ever give you. Here's the problem with success in the world. It's always gonna, you're going to get it, and then it's going to be taken away. Whether it be the younger person coming up after you when you hit your 50s, whether it be an illness where the company just starts giving your work to others, and you see yourself becoming less and less important, less and less needed, how about this, less and less wanted? That's what the world has for you. And then finally, you end up in a nursing home. I have a man there now who's, who's just really bitter over his circumstances. He's got dementia, and I'm friends with his family, so I know his background. And uh, everything he had has been stripped away from him. And he didn't have his faith on the rock, and now he's miserable. And, but praise God, this past Wednesday was the first time he came to church at Heritage. Praise God. I was coming home from Gordon's graduation. You don't even know this. And, and I, I got a call from this woman who I used to work with at the funeral home. See how life works? See how God works? I don't work there anymore. I work maybe three funerals a year now. You know? And, and here this woman who hasn't worked there for five years calls me and says, Chris, I, I need a favor. Would you go visit my grandpa? They said that he's doing really bad. And, you know, so God, through Karen... Through a job I barely even work anymore, she's not even there, through that used her to reach me for this man I've never met before that God is calling. I wonder how many people before me were called to minister to this man and didn't. I don't know, maybe none. Bottom line is it's his responsibility and his fault. It's not God's that he rejected God, that he put all his faith in the world just to have it stripped away by dementia. Right? I don't care how I die. I mean, I don't want to die. I don't want to have dementia and Alzheimer's. I don't want to go that way. But I don't really care because my faith is secure. Regardless of what happens that last 10 years or whatever, my faith is secure. 
I know I won't be this. I will never be a miserable person. I won't be. I got Jesus. I got so much. The, the closer I get to death, the more excited I get about, about the fullness being revealed to me. You see, that's something the world will never have. But I have uh, promises of so much more than just that in this life, right here and right now. And he's revealed it to me. I got all of you in my life. I got this trial of this hospital, and, and we're going to get blessed. We're going to get so blessed. I'm, God is, is, is allowing me to see the miraculous in my life, my lifetime, through you and through circumstance, through the attacks of the enemies. He's showing me the miraculous in my life. Hallelujah. Amen. That's a good place for that. <laughs> Unless there's a real passion for God, there's no worship in spirit. At the same time, worship must be in truth. That is, properly informed. It's important. It must be properly informed. How do you get properly informed on God? I mean, we're talking about intellectual understanding. How do we get properly informed? You won't get it from the Quran. You won't get it from the Bhagavad Gita. You won't get it from any books from Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. You won't get it from any books from Timothy Leary. You won't get it from any books from uh, Deepak Chopra. You won't get it from any books from Oprah. You won't. You will get a perverted truth at best. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through him. There's only one name under heaven by which men can be saved. All that information's in here. Get informed. Now, if you get this and you don't get the spirit, you end up being a religious zealot. You end up being a Pharisee. Don't, don't be a Pharisee. I should get a bumper sticker written up. Don't be a Pharisee. Don't be like Ananias. Exactly. But this is part of the picture. Both are necessary for satisfying and God-honoring worship. Spirit without truth. This, this was another really impacted me line. And this is from this commentary by uh, James Montgomery Boyce. Spirit without truth leads to a shallow, over-emotional experience that could be compared to a high. As soon as the emotion is over, when the fervor cools, so does the worship. Folks, I just gave you a sentence that applies to 80% of the church today with the focus on the worship, the lights, all that stuff. I'm not saying they're all necessarily bad, but when your God experience is based around the entertainment of the band, you are riding an emotional religion that is not based on knowledge. Truth without spirit can result in a dry, passionless encounter. So you need spirit and you need truth. Worship without the spirit, with just the truth, can lead to a form of joyless legalism. The best combination of both aspects of worship results in a joyous appreciation of God, informed by scripture. I'm listening to, uh, I, have, I have a tape, I love this CD, it's from a very, it's probably the most popular ministry in the United States right now, they have their own band that's on the circuit. And, they have worship, and, and I just love it. And I'm, I'm listening to this song, and, it, and she's crying out in the chorus, um, you see it all, you see it all, you're in everything. Well, that's not scripture. That's actually heresy. You see, that's pantheism. God is not in everything. He is ever-present. Now, I, I honestly don't think she meant it as pantheism. I don't think she was taught that. But it's a mistake. But you wouldn't know that if you, like me, studied Eastern religions, did yoga for years, had a guru, believed in pantheism. Then I entered into Christianity, and I don't study the Bible. And then I hear that song, and I'm still worshiping a pantheistic God because I'm not informed. You see how easily a person could, and you see now you're like this. Now instead of being on the narrow path, you've just entered onto the highway that leads to destruction. 
Now, how far will you go? Will you be corrected? I, you know, you've got to learn your Bibles. Amen? You've got to learn your Bibles. So, we're done. Um, if I had to sum up this message today, it's, it's drink from me and then give me a drink. You've been given eternal life by Jesus. You've been called to such a high calling. It's the highest calling in the world. You can, there's no, I don't care if you're called to be the president of an of a international corporation. It will be nothing compared to the calling you have in Christ Jesus. What greater honor could a person have in their life than to make their life a drink offering to God? Now, be forewarned. Many times you will not see the fruits of that in this lifetime. You, nobody will give you a parade. You won't be invited to achieve, achieve, uh, receive a lifetime achievement award by the Red Cross, by the National Heart Association. Right? Maybe you will. Who knows? But uh, I doubt it. May we all minister to God with our lives. May our lives be a drink offering to him, a life willingly, wholeheartedly given over to Jesus. And then watch and see what he does. Amen? Amen. Father God, I thank you for this word, Lord. And I, I praise your holy name. And I, and I ask you, Lord, as we um, leave this place, as we, as we live this day, Lord, as we spend time alone, as we spend time with our families, as we spend time at work, as we spend time in the company of others. May we worship you. Lord, may our lives just be totally about worshiping you. Even if it's just me being alone, working the garden and going, Lord, thank you. Thank you that you've given me these hands and this ability to work this garden. To fill out this form, Lord, in your name. May I do it as best as I can for you. May we do our lives the best that we can for you, for love's sake, in the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>